Members, uh, we'll begin with the, uh, the listed questions for oral answer to First Minister and Deputy First Minister. And I call Mr. Michael Copeland. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number one. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I will answer questions one, three, and nine together. The coastal flooding of recent days and the risks associated with it presented an extremely challenging situation for us all, public and uh, emergency responders alike. It was a great relief that the flooding was not as severe as initial assessments indicated in some areas. The Executive met on Friday the 3rd of January to assess the risk from coastal flooding and agreed that our departments and agencies would cooperate fully in the emergency response which was led by the PSNI and urged the public not to risk their own safety and to continue to cooperate fully with responders. The PSNI led the multi-agency response involving 40 organizations who responded quickly to minimize the risk and impact of the flooding. In all, some 45,000 sandbags were used to protect homes and key infrastructure. This highly effective response reflects the level of preparedness in, that was put in place to deal with a whole range of emergencies, including flooding. Indeed, an exercise to test the multi-agency response to widespread coastal flooding took place as recently as last November. We will not be complacent, but will continue to improve our emergency preparedness through the work of the Civil Contingencies Group Northern Ireland, led by OFM, DFM, and that of other groups of key responders. In line with good practice, the PSNI, as the coordinators of the response to this emergency, will conduct a multi-agency debrief to identify learning points. These will be applied in order to further strengthen our ability to respond to future emergencies. I call Mr. Michael Copeland for a supplementary. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for his uh, um, fulsome answer and would also join him in paying tribute to those who were involved in preparing for what could have become a very um, dangerous and indeed nasty situation. Could I ask the First Minister um, what role was considered for the Civil Contingencies Group? Uh, what factors were considered and what um, information coloured the eventual outcome and the, the way in which the response was structured? Well, first of all, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I want to, to join and maybe extend uh, the thanks because uh, while obviously a, a number of government uh, departments and agencies were involved, there was a very considerable effort at a community level uh, to give assistance to those in the, the local community, and I think that has to be praised how people rallied round in those uh, severe circumstances. Uh, in relation to the uh, triggering of the Civil Contingencies uh, Northern Ireland Group, uh, we discussed that uh, when I, I met with the, uh, the head of the Civil Service, who obviously chairs that uh, group, uh, along with the PSNI uh, on the uh, Saturday evening, I think it was, uh, and, uh, or maybe it was on the Friday evening, and we considered at that stage that uh, we would leave it to the call of the police as to whether they felt it was sufficiently broadly based around the province to require that to be done. At that stage, uh, it was uh, determined that most of the requirement would be in the Belfast area, and particularly in East Belfast, but that there could be patches outside. As it transpired, some of the places outside were hit much more strongly than had been uh, anticipated. Uh, but it was ready to be called, and the, the head of the civil service was ready to bring people together and had put them on notice that should the PSNI require it, then that uh, civil contingency group would be brought together. Thank you. And I call Mr. Kieran McCarthy for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank the First Minister for his response. And I'm glad that he recognised that there are places outside East Belfast because whenever I was looking for sandbags, and originally I was told to go to Inverary Avenue or Inverary Community Centre, but eventually they came down to the Irish Peninsula, which uh, deserved uh, to have the treatment. Um, the Prime Minister last week informed us that he is spending over one billion on coastal erosion and sea defences and flooding. Will the First Minister commit this executive to spending whatever it takes now to ensure that coastal erosion and um, the sea defences and flooding will uh, be a thing of the past and that will not happen again? 
Well, uh, of course, the, the executive is the only body that commit its, can commit itself. Uh, I can say that the Deputy First Minister and I had a, a conversation with the uh, head of the civil service uh, in terms of how we can make an assessment, uh, because the assessment that has been carried out by the PSNI would be very much on the basis uh, of uh, how the responders uh, acted uh, in relation to the emergency. But we need to have uh, a response on, in terms of what was the uh, level of danger of coastal er erosion at various points. And that's something that I think that uh, probably several of our government departments need to liaise, particularly road service, uh, in terms of giving us uh, an indicator of what steps are necessary. We were dealing with a, an event that we were told uh, is in the sort of once in 200 years. Uh, but over the last number of uh, years, I seem to be coming to this dispatch box all too often about <laughs> events that were only supposed to happen once every 100 or 200 years. And it's very clear though there might be some people who deny uh, climate change, that there are factors at play that uh, would indicate that these will be much more regular events. Uh, that being the case, I think we need to look at some more permanent uh, answers to these questions. The sandbags, to me, are very much uh, a last century. They did the job, and they did the job uh, well. But I think uh, in terms of people's homes, uh, there are potential ways of looking at uh, whether you can get domestic mechanisms that seal to the doors to stop water coming in, which are, are, are much better and quicker to put in place. Uh, there's also the issue of whether walls need to be fortified, and I hope that's the kind of response that the Deputy First Minister and I will get from the two departments concerned. Thank you, and I call Mr. Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and could I thank the First Minister for his answer so far. Uh, I know the First Minister saw at first hand the level of flood preparedness in East Belfast, but could he outline his view on local resilience that was shown right throughout the province? Well, I think in, in terms of uh, the uh, responders, uh, I think they uh, acted well right across the, the province. I do enter this caveat because uh, while I think there are very few people that will complain about the way uh, the civil contingencies organizations responded in this case, this was a case that we had notice of. We had several weeks of knowledge of this coming about, uh, and therefore there was the opportunity for us to be in a better stage of preparedness, uh, unlike when you have a, a heavy deluge of, of rain, uh, which uh, strikes you overnight, and you have to respond uh, immediately without uh, the uh, immediate preparation. So I think we do need to, to look at how we can step up the preparation for other kinds of uh, emergency. Belfast, of course, is very well placed because Belfast uh, has a, uh, a civil contingency organization that is there. It's been running well. It's in place. Uh, and it has its own uh, structure already set in place. That is not the case in all parts of Northern Ireland. Uh, we have uh, an official uh, report indicating that uh, there should be uh, legislation passed in this uh, assembly uh, to require councils, place a duty on councils uh, to have this kind of uh, uh, civil contingency planning done. Uh, I very much uh, support that. I think we're going to have to look at that. And it should be a lot easier to do uh, when we're looking at the 11 larger councils than it is with uh, 26, some of them very small. Thank you. And I call Mr. George Robinson. Question two, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I will answer questions two and 14 together. Our international engagement during the last year has created a number of potential investment opportunities. Uh, I make no apology for our continuing commitment to meet all influencers and business representatives in an effort to promote trade, tourism, and inward investment in Northern Ireland and to establish university and government links. Visits to Asia last year included China and, more recently, Japan. We continue to engage with officials from the Chinese government on a number of projects, including the opening of an office in Beijing later this year. This will be a big step in strengthening relations between Northern Ireland and China. Once this is established, there will be an opportunity to further explore relationships in other parts of China. When we visited Japan in December, the Deputy First Minister and I met with Prime Minister Abe and Senior Vice uh, Foreign Minister. Our program also included meetings with the British and Irish ambassadors to Japan and their trade and investment representatives and a number of uh, Japanese companies already established in Northern Ireland. 
It was particularly rewarding for us to meet again with prospective Japanese investors who attended the hugely successful investment conference last October in Belfast. We also hosted a Northern Irish Connections event where we met with a number of uh, diaspora and Japanese people with an interest in helping the executive promote its objectives in Japan. We are confident that this series of meetings will help strengthen links with the Japanese government and business sector and increase the potential for new and sustainable sources of foreign direct investment in Northern Ireland. Tangible and very welcome evidence of this was the announcement on the 10th of December of a new 192 job project at Fujitsu in Londonderry. Northern Ireland has a long-standing and active business relationship with Japan. Major Japanese investors include Fujitsu, Terumu, BCT, Japanese uh, Tobacco, uh, Ryobi, uh, and uh, Canon. Collectively, they employ some 3,000 people across Northern Ireland. The growth and longevity of uh, Japanese investment is testament to the culture and commitment of its companies to sustainable overseas collaboration. Well done. <laughs> I, George Robinson for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And could I thank uh, the First Minister for his uh, very detailed answer? Uh, what plans do you have to encourage investment and trade over the next year, which could, which could benefit areas such as the Northwest? And I know you didn't mention about new jobs that are coming to the Northwest, but there's other areas such as Mion and Lima Valley which could benefit greatly from new jobs. Well, I know that Fujitsu are uh, already uh, employing people, so I hope that some people from Lima Valley can stretch themselves to go to Londonderry to uh, take up some of the jobs that are available uh, as a result of that uh, initiative. Uh, the Deputy First Minister and I very much operate uh, at the behest of Invest Northern Ireland and the Deputy Minister Arlene Foster. Uh, we are there to give them support where they think that our presence can give them access to, to companies uh, and where we can persuade them uh, to, to look at Northern Ireland more seriously. Uh, we have done that consistently over the last number of years, uh, I think with very uh, positive uh, impact. Uh, I indicated in the immediate answer to the, the question that we were intending to open uh, uh, an office in Beijing uh, and I, I hope that uh, not just the Deputy First Minister and I but I hope that other ministers uh, will attempt to create links with, uh, with China using the, the base of that uh, office to, to do so. Uh, we of course remain active in the United States and Canada, the Middle East, we are pushing hard in uh, India and Brazil. Uh, and any steps that the Deputy First Minister and I can take to give support, we will do so. And I call Mr. Desi Michaelier. Uh, uh, last can call you. Uh, the Minister more or less answered my question with his final comments there. Uh, I was going to ask him, um, you know, certainly in the short term, is there what future trips are planned in search of jobs and investment? Well, as I've indicated, we have nothing scheduled beyond going to the United States uh, in March. Uh, though we will be required to, to go to uh, uh, Beijing, I suspect, uh, to open the new uh, office. Uh, in March, uh, we are being uh, asked by Invest Northern Ireland uh, to uh, extend the St. Patrick's Day visit. Well, I'm saying St. Patrick's Day visit because I think this time we actually get back in time for St. Patrick's Day because the, the way the White House has uh, arranged uh, their events. But they, uh, Invest, I think, want us to go to the, the West Coast of the United States and to, to speak to a number of potential clans there. Uh, so that will be the, the first investment trip that we're likely to have during the course of this year. And it comes, I call Fergal McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the First Minister. Uh, in discussing the October Investment Conference, the First Minister talked about many of the building blocks in place to take our economy to a higher level. Will the First Minister encourage his party to ensure they sign up to one of those major building blocks, the Haas paper? Well, I think we'll have a very full debate uh, on this issue later on, and I, I look forward to that uh, debate. Uh, I think we all recognise that there is a responsibility on the political parties, especially those that are in the uh, Northern Ireland Executive, uh, to fulfil the requirements set down in the terms of reference. Uh, to the panel of uh, parties as they did their work. Uh, they were asked to come forward with a report indicating the level of agreement that there was, and I hope that his party will join with others in doing that. And Mr. Given is not in this place, so I call Mr. Danny Kinnahan. Question number five, please, Principal Deputy Speaker. 
I am pleased to say uh, that uh, things are moving in the, the right direction, some might say too slowly. Uh, while three years ago 58% of freedom of information requests were answered outside the 20-day time limit, this improved to 56 in 2012 and 35% in 2013. Uh, although this is not satisfactory, it is clear that progress has been made. Call Mr. Kinahan for supplementary. Thank you very much, um, Principal Deputy Speaker. May I thank the First Minister for his answer. I think many of us would see it being so slow that it's actually a disgrace and that we need to move it as quickly as possible. And it's a vital part of our democratic system. How many of those FFIs are over a year old? Last part again. How many of those Freedom for Information were over a year old? Well, my understanding is that of those that we presently have, I think there are six FOIs that have not yet been answered. Uh, one of them, the longest one, goes back to uh, July, so which is less than uh, a year. Uh, I don't think that anybody is su suggesting that uh, we, we should be satisfied with the, the process. Uh, I have to say that it is much more difficult in a department that has two ministers because uh, it requires both to be satisfied with the, the way an FOI is uh, responded to. Indeed, I think we have probably responded to FOIs that we could quite easily have refused to respond to because uh, the uh, excessive cost of providing uh, an answer, but we have sought where possible to, to do so. Uh, and we have indeed uh, put in place uh, improvements uh, to the procedures and processing uh, and tracking of FOIs which should see that steady progress continuing. Well, Mr. John Dallet. Uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I thank the First Minister for, he, for his answer. Would the, would the uh, First Minister agree with me that in addition to answering FOIs, there is a need to respond to motions passed in this House, and I think in particular of two motions passed uh, encouraging the uh, recall of the Civic Forum? Civic Forum. How you get that under FOIs? <laughs> Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, uh, it's a bit of a stretch of the FOI question, I, I, I recognise, but uh, I congratulate the, the member for being able to stretch it that far and get off with it. Uh, the, the reality, of course, is that the Deputy First Minister have uh, many important issues, and we are often uh, out and about in the, the community uh, hearing the real concerns of people, I have to say, in all of these years, I've yet to meet anybody that's been pressing me to sort out the civic quorum. Okay, and before I call the next speaker, uh, it's, the minister always has the option of uh, not answering a question if he feels that it's completely outside the original. I, <laughs> I call Ms. Anna Lowe. Question number six, please. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister Jonathan Bell to answer this question. As uh, outlined in the Together Building a United Community, we are committed to publishing a sexual orientation strategy. A draft consultation document uh, to inform public consultation on the strategy is currently under consideration within our department and will be published once the consultation uh, process has been completed. And I call Ms. Anna Lowe for a supplementary. Thank you. I would like to thank the junior minister's uh, brief response. Can I put this to the first minister, though, who is the head of the department? And is he away? He's not here. Oh, he's here. Right. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> just, just, uh, just, uh, Mr. Bell's uh, obstructing my view of the first minister. Given the DUP's opposition to the recent debate calling for the strategy to be published as a matter of priority, can I ask the Minister directly, does he support the publication of this strategy, and if so, what has he done to speed up the process? Thank the uh, Honourable Lady for her question. I didn't realise I was that big to shield other uh, members in this House. Perhaps the New Year's Diet will have to <laughs> kick into place. Uh, it was the Executive's uh, commitment, uh, not just the Office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister. We led on that, but it's the Executive's commitment under Together uh, Building a United uh, Community to publish the Sexual Orientation Strategy. I've met with a, a range of groups uh, in connection with that. My officials have met with a range of groups. We've listened to concerns. 
Uh, we've led on, on other areas against violence and verbal abuse and attacks on property and on homes and a number of issues that were raised with us we have currently led on uh, during the process and we've also spoken with the groups concerned as to what are the best methods for them uh, in terms of the consultation process. What would uh, enable them to give the most fulsome answers? Uh, what uh, means of communication, including the use of information technology, would allow for the fullest and most comprehensive uh, level of responses to be brought back with us? I have to say that uh, the feedback that I've received and uh, I received as of uh, just a couple of days ago last week uh, from officials directly engaged uh, with a number of groups. They were very pleased uh, with the way uh, communication was going and where the strategy is at. But we are committed under Together Building the United Community to publish that sexual orientation strategy. Thank you. And I call Ms Paula, Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Junior Minister for his answers thus far. And can I ask the Junior Minister how the intended sexual orientation strategy would fit within the overall equality context? Can I also thank the Honourable Lady for a question. It's an important one uh, within the overall uh, equality context. Uh, our department, no FM, DFM, has a track record of engaging with and proactively seeking to protect vulnerable groups within our society. We have, through numerous strategies, uh, sought to ensure protection for the ambit, the whole ambit, of Section 75 groups, including the age sector, the gender sector, the race, disability, etc. The sexual uh, orientation strategy would form part of the overall equality suite of services. Sean Rogers for his answer so far and I'd ask the Minister what discussions have you had with the Department of Education in terms of addressing the issue of homophobic bullying in schools? Well the initiative in Together Building a United uh, Community addresses all of those matters. Um, we are aware of the situation uh, and uh, we're very clear and in all the discussions that the executive has had in terms of together building a united community that nobody should experience verbal abuse nobody should experience bullying and there are a range of resources that uh, mr O'Dowd, as minister of education can more comprehensively outline in terms of what has happened under the remit in terms of the anti-bullying strategy uh, which is endorsed i don't think any young person should have to experience verbal abuse physical abuse, damage to their property, damage to their possessions. Uh, schools are, as you would know, as a distinguished former headmaster of one, have very robust uh, policies in place. We've got very clear reporting mechanisms in place. And a number of charities, including Bernardo's, NSPCC, have a number of measures in place. Uh, I know even schools within my own constituency, Regent House, McGovernors, has dedicated schools councillor in place, in situ, uh, where young people can report any incident uh, of bullying that comes to them. And the encouragement would go out to young people not to suffer uh, in silence, uh, that there are mechanisms in place where young people will be listened to. There are very robust uh, child protection uh, procedures in place, both uh, within schools, uh, with dedicated pastoral care teachers, uh, and also within social services, should it get to that level in terms of con in conjunction with the police, of addressing uh, serious incidences uh, of bullying. And the message would go out to young people, talk to somebody within your own family, talk to your friends, talk to somebody in authority that you trust, and your concerns will be addressed, and there are measures in place to redress any acts of bullying which shouldn't have occurred in the first place. I call Mr. Phil Flanagan. Question number seven. Mr. President, Deputy Speaker, the Executive's Economy and Jobs Initiative has identified a commitment that OFM DFM should bring forward proposals to boost economic activity through the retrofitting of energy efficient measures into homes. A project team is working with stakeholders and recognised industry experts to identify options which will enable householders to improve the energy efficiency of their homes and help address the prevalence of fuel poverty. A market survey is due to begin at the end of January 
and this will help to determine demand for a range of energy retrofit options and to re refine programme design ahead of any proposed programme delivery. Following the market survey, proposals will be prepared for our consideration. It is important, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, that any proposals will both complement and supplement existing fuel poverty and energy efficiency initiatives. Thank you. Mr. Phil Flanagan for a supplementary. I thank the, the Minister for his answer. Um, I would be concerned about the range of experts that have been appointed given the, the previous bad advice that was provided to the Social Development Minister on this issue, but we will wait and see. But can I ask the, the Minister how um, the retrofit programme will tackle the ongoing issue of fuel poverty, um, which is actually getting worse instead of improving, as um, was supposed to be the case? Well, it is very clear that uh, if measures can be brought forward, which uh, re reduce the cost of keeping a home warm. It uh, helps to reduce fuel uh, poverty. Uh, and I should say that uh, I, I recognise some scepticism from the earlier part of his uh, supplementary question. Uh, in speaking to officials about this issue, uh, I was pleased to hear that real progress is being made uh, on this uh, occasion uh, under the uh, the tutelage of uh, the Deputy First Minister and myself, we are fairly confident that proposals will come out uh, in a very short period of time. Jimmy Spratt. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, this type of initiative has the potential uh, to be a significant boost to the Northern Ireland economy. Uh, can the First Minister ensure that uh, small to medium-sized companies across Northern Ireland will be able to draw uh, down work uh, from this in initiative whenever it is ruled out eventually? Well, the member is absolutely right. Uh, it uh, not only has the, the impact uh, on uh, homes, uh, which uh, ensures that there is a, a greater efficiency in terms of, uh, of energy uh, usage, uh, but it also provides much needed uh, work. Uh, and therefore can uh, expand uh, the, the number of jobs that uh, are operating within the construction industry. Uh, of course, we have to wait until we see the pro proposals brought before us, but I would be very surprised if we are dealing with the, the whole of Northern Ireland that it would not therefore involve a range of companies right across Northern Ireland. And I call Mr. Loris Kelly for a quick uh, supplementary. <laughs> Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I ask uh, the First Minister how many jobs have been created when, within socially disadvantaged and excluded communities as a result of this initiative of his department? Well, we're, we're waiting for the uh, initiative to work its way through. Uh, I think that there is a, a tendency uh, on the, the part of members at, at times. To, to look at these things through the, the negative end of the, the telescope. There is massive potential uh, in this uh, set of uh, proposals. Potential that uh, will, first of all, save energy within the, the province, therefore reduce the household costs of many people, bringing people out of fuel poverty, and at the same time will provide much needed jobs uh, in the construction se uh, sector where they are most required at the, the present time. So I would ask members to be supportive of what we are doing. Uh, we will, I hope, be able to bring encouraging news before the Assembly uh, within uh, a matter of uh, a few months. Uh, and I hope at that stage we will be able to see the outworking of those proposals in a way that I hope will uh, cheer even the, the member uh, for upper ban. <laughs> I'm going to call Mr. Patsy McGlone. Patsy McGlone. Question number eight, Mr. Prince of the panel of parties in Northern Ireland uh, executive concluded its discussions on parades, select commemorations and related protests, flags and emblems and contending with the past on the 31st of December 2013 uh, without an overall agreement. A draft document was forwarded to the Deputy First Minister and me by the chair of the panel, Dr. Richard uh, Haas. Uh, and the Deputy Chair, Megan O'Sullivan, uh, on the same day, uh, and at that time we placed it on the Executive's website for wider consideration. Members, that is uh, the end of the period for listed questions. We will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And Mr Easton is not in his place, so I call Mr David. Oh, oh there he is. Okay, excuse me, <laughs> Ali. So Mr Ali Easton. 
Thank you. Um, could Not I ask the usual the, place. Yes. <laughs> could I ask the First Minister, how do you see the process moving forward after the recent House talks? Well, what is required uh, if we are to move forward in Northern Ireland is to reach agreement on outstanding issues. Uh, I think that uh, the unfortunate element of the Haas process has been that uh, while we now know what Dr Haas and uh, Professor O'Sullivan uh, believed would be able to gain widespread support uh, with the, the parties, uh, we do not have itemised the level of agreement that there might be in any of the hundreds of elements of that overall proposal. So I think it's necessary for a working group to, to sit down, to work out where there had been agreement and to uh, identify areas where further work is uh, required. I hope all the, the parties uh, are up for that. Uh, I know that uh, the uh, Ulster Unionists and the Alliance Party have both indicated that they're willing to be part of such a process. I was pleased to see in the House of Commons Dr Alistair MacDonald uh, indicate that he was willing to be, indeed was urging uh, the Secretary of State to be involved in a process that would do precisely that. My party is certainly uh, up for it. So I, I hope that uh, when the, the party leaders meet tomorrow that they can reach that kind of agreement. I call Mr Easton for a supplementary. Could I thank the First Minister for his answer. Um, who should cherish uh, the next step of the process and does he envisage Mr Haas returning? I don't know. I think there, there are laws against uh, inhumane treatment, uh, <laughs> so I, I'm not sure that uh, we would uh, want to, to push uh, Dr. Haas to, to return. Uh, I think certainly uh, I would be very happy if he did return, but uh, I suspect when he indicated that uh, he was leaving on the 31st of December and wasn't going to go beyond that, that that is his uh, fixed position. Uh, I note that the Secretary of State has offered uh, herself to uh, chair the next phase uh, of the, the process. Again, I, I'd be quite content with that. But uh, the choice of who chairs has been left with the five parties collectively. That was how Dr. Haas uh, was uh, appointed. So I suspect if the parties are agreeable to a further phase, then the parties themselves will determine who it will be appropriate to chair. Thank you. I call Mr. David Hildridge. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, First Minister, are you aware of the statement made by the Dard Minister criticising the Finance Minister uh, for taking court action over her failure to bring uh, her decision on the cap reform to the Executive? And if so, what comment do you have in relation to it? Well, I, I wasn't uh, in for that part of uh, the Dard Minister's statement. I came in at the tail end of the statement, so she clearly made the remarks before I, I entered. Um, I'm not sure it's altogether appropriate for the Dard Minister to, to make uh, comments uh, if they were made in the, the fashion that is suggested. I would have thought that uh, the person who has uh, breached the ministerial code and be found to have acted unlawfully is not in a strong position uh, to censor the person who drew attention to such a breach. Thank you, Principal Deputy and thank the First Minister for this answer. But what are the implications, do you believe, the decision would have for the operation of the Executive? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, this isn't the first time we've been faced with uh, these kind of judgments. There's been a uh, series of uh, rulings uh, from the High Court, and this one, remember, was from the Lord Chief Justice, uh, that have indicated the necessity uh, to uh, bring any matter which is uh, significant or controversial or cross-cutting uh, to the executive. Uh, that remains a position. I think it does require each minister to reflect more closely on the decisions that they are taking and whether they fall within those categories. Uh, of course, we have not yet seen the written judgment of the Lord Chief Justice on this matter, which uh, might uh, be helpful to us. Uh, but I, I really do think that the, the executive does need to sit down and decide how it operates in, t in terms of taking decisions. We don't want to grind an executive to uh, a standstill, but it is necessary that uh, if there are decisions to, to be taken that are pointed up by other ministers as being controversial or significant or cross-cutting, then the minister should not try and avoid the requirement that is laid down uh, in the ministerial code to bring it to the, uh, the executive. Thank you, and I call Ms. Stewart, Mr. Stuart Dixon. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, First Minister, 
one of the positives coming out of the Haas talks was uh, a proposal uh, agreed by all parties that the Victims Commissioner should assess better ways uh, to meet the financial needs of those seriously injured as a result of the past. Is the First Minister prepared with the uh, Deputy First Minister to add direction to the terms of the Victims Commissioner's terms of reference to deal with this matter now? Well, I am sometimes overcome by the enthusiasm of some parties in the, the Chamber to get the Deputy First Minister and I to do various things, though those same parties are the parties that uh, talk about a, a DUP, Sinn Féin, uh, carve-up or tag team. Uh, if the five parties sat down as part of a panel and reached agreements, then the five parties should bring those agreements that they reached as required by their terms of reference to the Deputy First Minister and myself. They have yet to do that. Uh, we have had Dr. Haas's view uh, of the, the matter. We have not had uh, any paper from the panel which was required under the terms of reference indicating the areas where there are agreement. Uh, and all of the areas where there are agreement, uh, I believe, if they are capable of moving forward uh, on their own, we'll certainly be prepared to, to look at that, and that can be brought to the, uh, the executive. But the first job, I believe, of that panel is to sit down, go through the 340 elements of agreement that are contained within the Haas proposals, and each of them determine whether they agree with those elements to see how many of those overall level uh, elements of agreement uh, are shared by all of the, the five parties and therefore can be acted upon. Call Mr. Stuart Dixon for a supplementary. Um, thank you to the First Minister for his comments. Uh, First Minister, a proposal has been made with regards to a pension for those uh, with uh, conflict-related serious injuries. What actions or proposals have you to take or comment to make on that proposal? Well, I think the, the comment I make is the same that I made earlier that for us to, to look at any set of proposals, it is necessary for the panel to bring them forward. The panel has yet not done that. Uh, and I, I really do suggest that the requirement that we set down in our terms of reference for the panel, not Dr. Haas, for the panel to bring forward the areas of uh, agreement, the panel should meet to carry out that uh, obligation that is placed on them so that we can look at each of the individual proposals that are agreed by all. I call Mr. John Dallet. Uh, Mr. Deputy uh, Speaker, I'm sure the Minister will be pleased uh, that I'm moving away from the Haas talks. And we, as we are discussing topical questions, the Minister will be aware that today one of the most courageous clergymen to emerge during the Troubles, the Reverend David Armstrong, called on the former First Minister to apologise for deeds or words of the past. Would the First Minister agree with me that the ability to say sorry for the past is an essential element of permanent peace and reconciliation here. Well, I'm not sure that the, the member has moved away from the, the Haas proposals because, of course, contained within the Haas proposals, uh, there was a, an issue relating to uh, acknowledgement of the, the past. Uh, I have to say that I do not want to acquit those who operated within the democratic process with those who went out and quite deliberately uh, killed and maimed uh, individuals yeah, uh, in yeah, our society. Yeah. So uh, I, I think that all of us, uh, when we make mistakes, and there is not one in this chamber that has not done so, uh, we should be prepared to uh, indicate that we have made those uh, mistakes. It is a lesson not just for party leaders, but perhaps for party members, and not just for DUP party leaders, but also for those who are members of the SDLP. I call Mr. Dallin for supplementary. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I uh, welcome the First Minister's response, and if I have said something in the past which was wrong, I apologise publicly for it. Would he now encourage his former party leader to do likewise? Well, I, I imagine that is a public apology from the, the member for the SDLP support of a play park named after a, a terrorist uh, in County Down, uh, and uh, they, we will all note that. Uh, he's shaking his head, so he clearly doesn't apologise for the, the, the past. Uh, let me say this uh, in relation to the, the programme that uh, seems to have stirred up this, uh, this interest. Uh, Ian Paisley has been a, a major figure yeah. in public life in Northern Ireland for many generations. Uh, he was uh, active uh, while most of us in this uh, chamber uh, were either not born or were in short uh, trousers or in plaid skirts. 
Uh, the, the fact remains he made an enormous contribution to yeah. the, the life of Northern Ireland. He has a fantastic legacy that he has uh, left down. Uh, it, saddened me, it saddens me that it is being portrayed in the way that uh, this programme appears to, to do it, uh, but it does not take away from the very significant role that he has uh, played. But I honestly believe that uh, if uh, we are going to have interviews about the past, it is far better to have them when they are fresher in people's memories. Thank you, and I call Lord Morrow. Uh, thank you. Can I ask the First Minister if he could outline the position with regards to the Social Investment Fund? Yes, yeah, so, well, well, here again, real progress uh, has been made. As uh, I understand it, uh, the uh, officials have been uh, working uh, on uh, looking at the approval of uh, those that have already gone through the economic uh, appraisal. I believe that uh, literally within the next two or three weeks, uh, we'll be in a, a position to, to move forward with the, the first tranche of those, uh, which amounts to about, uh, well, over £30 million. Pounds. Well, Lord Morrow, for a supplementary. Uh, I thank the First Minister for his response. Can the Minister further tell us how many projects are in a position to have letters of offer uh, offered to them? Well, uh, as I understand it, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, the number that have already been uh, approved and have gone through the system amount to about uh, 22 schemes, but I understand that there are 14 that are virtually ready uh, as well. Uh, and of course, these are schemes that uh, are on the ground right across the province and will benefit local communities. Thank you. And I call Mr. Sidney Anderson. I thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, could the First Minister indicate what indications the decision in the DFP Dard case over the Christmas period will have for the Dixon Plan for Education in the Craig Alvin Tandagy area? <laughs> All politics is local, uh, Mr. <laughs> Principal <laughs> Deputy Speaker. Uh, I think I have always held the, the view that uh, the decisions been taken in relation to uh, the, the Dixon Plan in the Craig Avon uh, and surrounding area uh, was such that it would have to come to the executive. Um, I believe that uh, it would certainly be regarded as significant and controversial. Uh, if there is finance involved, it also becomes uh, cross-cutting. Uh, so uh, I think it is the, the recent decision is just a confirmation of what we already knew, and that was that such matters are matters that have to be brought to the executive. Thank you. And I call Mr Anderson for a supplement. I uh, thank you, and I thank the, the First Minister for that response. But can the First Minister indicate what steps would be taken if the Education Minister decided not to bring the decision to the executive? Well, it, it's a hypothetical question, uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I have no reason to believe that the... Uh, education Minister wouldn't bring it to the Executive. Indeed, the Education Minister might, uh, on reflection, uh, take a different position than that which has been adopted here to four, uh, and therefore it wouldn't be necessary to, to bring it to the, uh, the Executive. But uh, very clearly there, there are mechanisms uh, in place, both within this Assembly, where 30 or more members, if they sign a uh, petition of concern, can have the matter referred to the Executive. Any three executive uh, ministers can require the matter to be brought to the executive. The deputy first minister and I, acting jointly, can bring it to the, uh, the executive. So there are a number of ways that it can be brought there. But I, again, I repeat, I don't have any reason to believe that the education minister won't himself bring it to the executive if it requires a decision. Thank you. And I call Mr. Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. First Minister, could I ask you? When Richard Haas and Megan O'Sullivan were leaving, they said these proposals were not self-implementing. Could I ask you, as First Minister, what are your short-term goals for the, for the implementation plan? Well, I think that the member is confused. Uh, he needs to look again at the terms of reference. Uh, we don't simply throw a number of people into a room and say, get on with it. We give them terms of reference, and they act upon those terms of reference. The terms of reference place a responsibility on the panel of the parties to bring forward proposals where they have reached a agreement. They haven't done that as yet. I now know very clearly what Dr. Haas and Professor O'Sullivan's view was of what might be able to gain uh, widespread uh, acceptance. It's clear that it doesn't, and therefore it is up to the parties to identify within those proposals those elements that they can all agree to 
or indeed where there is a sufficient consensus that can agree to them uh, and therefore bring them forward so that the Deputy First Minister and I can then decide what the appropriate next steps would be. Thank you. And uh, that is time up for topical questions and we must now move on to